and welcome to worship from Broadway Baptist Church, Derby. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Rochelle and I am the minister. For the last four Sundays, we have enjoyed the hospitality of Melton Mowbray Baptist Church, but it is good to be back. If you're following this on Sunday morning and are local to Broadway Baptist, why not join in person at 11.30 in the church car park for communion? Do remember to bring your own communion and wrap up warmly. It's not as warm as we'd hoped. If there is anything in this service that encourages you, why not go to our Facebook page and write a comment there to encourage others? One thing that has encouraged 20 people or so who love crafting through lockdown is creating this hope banner. It's an offshoot from a lockdown project run from Aussie Row Baptist and 61 banner panels have been lovingly sewn, painted or created and put together in two panels with verses or thoughts underneath each one and hung as a source of prayer and reflection. And these will feature in different ways through this service. Another creative act has been in the kitchen, where instead of running our holiday at home for older people this year, this weekend we made and delivered over 90 cream teas locally. Residents at Kinsale Court were some of the happy recipients of the teas. Included in each box was a card with verses of hope, today's theme, and these will feature throughout the service too. Starting with verses from six, Psalm 62 and 71. Another creative act has been from the kitchen, where instead of running our holiday at home for older people this year, this weekend, we made and delivered over 90 cream teas locally. Residents at Kinsale Court were some of the happy recipients of the teas. Included in each box was a card with verses of hope. These two will feature through our service, starting with our call to worship from Psalms 62 and 71, read by Vanita, Janet and Margaret, before joining together with our first hymn today, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's Psalm 62, verses uh, 5 and 6. Yes, my soul, find rest in my God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. For you have been my hope, my sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more than one, more and more.
As we look to you today, scattered as we continue to be, would we know your presence with us now, wherever we are? Would you help us to call to mind brothers and sisters in Christ who make up the body that is Broadway Baptist Church? Forgive us where we fall short in word and deed. Cleanse and restore us by your Holy Spirit and open your word to us by your Spirit today. Amen. We continue in prayer as our young people lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you to our young people. As we think about hope today, let me ask you, what does it mean to you? There are the things that we hope for and then there is the hope itself. And then what are the conditions in which hope grows? Think about your own life. When have you been hopeful? When have you felt like hope has vanished? You might just want to pause this video now to think about it or if you're following this service with someone to talk to them about it. What is hope? What are the conditions do we need to have it? Feel free to be creative and make something or write a comment on our Facebook page. The hymn we have just sung is a familiar and well-loved hymn, a great hymn of hope. And we like to sing it with great gusto. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. They are great words of hope and trust and confidence that we love so well. But do you know where they come from? Do you know the context in which they were originally written? They actually come from one of the most difficult periods of Israel's history in the Hebrew Scriptures. 
portrayed in Jeremiah and Lamentations, two books that I've been reading through during lockdown. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He was called as a very young man, too young as far as Jeremiah was concerned. And he was given the task of warning Israel that if they didn't start following the Lord according to the ways that had been set down, they were going to lose everything, literally everything. They were going to be taken from their land into exile to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, where they would spend 70 years in exile. Long story short, they chose not to listen. They didn't believe Jeremiah as he warned and cajoled them for 40 years. And while they didn't listen, you might have thought he would be rewarded by the Lord for his faithfulness. But no, he was ridiculed, imprisoned, chucked into a cistern, accused of being a spy for Babylon. It was not an enviable role to have. Eventually, everything that Jeremiah said would happen came to pass. Jeremiah was one of the few left in Jerusalem, or what was left of it, and his heart was broken, and it is out of this period of grief that Lamentations was written. Well, while scholars debate the authorship today, traditionally it has been ascribed to Jeremiah, which for ease I'm going with this morning. If you've ever read it, you will be aware of how it is an outpouring of suffering. But what we miss in our English translations is the form. It's not simply just an outpouring of grief. It's a series of highly stylized poems, five in all, the first four chapters following the pattern of an alphabetic acrostic. So 22 verses in each chapter, except chapter three, which has 66 verses, three verses at a time on this acrostic. And writer David Slavitt has translated Lamentations in a form to help us grasp this and uh, better. So Jill is going to give us a taster from chapter three. Afflicted am I and beset, a man whom God in his wrath has abased, abused by his rod and broken, I am driven into the darkness. Against me he turned his hand, and again and again. Bones broken, wasted, I am besieged and battered. Bitterness is my portion and tribulation. Banished, I dwell in the darkest darkness, like those who are long dead. Chained, so I cannot escape, and walled in, I am a captive. Crying for help, I call out, but he will not hear my prayer. Crooked are all my paths, which he has blocked with boulders. Well, and so it continues. Slavit really picks up the depth of the anguish of the author. But perhaps the surprising aspect of what Jill read is the way the prophet's suffering is placed squarely at God's door. He takes the experience of Babylon to describe his current circumstances. He says he's besieged and battered, a picture of what had happened to them all in Jerusalem. He is walled in, he says. It's a form of punishment to imprison people by literally bricking them up so they didn't have space to move. Literally walled in. He says he is desolate. Everyone laughs at him. Well, if the situation wasn't bad enough, if you go back to the end of chapter 2, we read that Jerusalem was so horrific that mothers were killing their children to eat. There was nothing available to them. This is beyond all our experiences. So for two and a half chapters, there is this outpouring of grief and then suddenly it is turned. Jill is going to read again, but this time from the NIV picking up at verse 16. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. 
So I say my splendour is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Thank you, Jill. What we notice is that the beginning of the reading continues in much the same spirit as the previous verses Jill had read out. But suddenly, suddenly it is as though the sun breaks through and he says, this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Here are the words of that great hymn. But it's sandwiched in the middle of a description of an horrendous situation. The situation hasn't changed. The pain in Jeremiah's heart is just as acute. But something has shifted. Turn back with me to verse 18. He says, my splendour is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. In other words, there is great anguish in all that Jeremiah had lost. All that he hoped for from the Lord was gone. He was in poverty. He was left with nothing but bitterness and gall. And I think this is key. When we come to God, when we put faith in Jesus, most of us have hopes and expectations of what we will get in return. Somehow we pick up that life will be easier, it will be more blessed, it will perhaps mean a rise, it will mean a life free of illness or at least major illness. These are the things that we expect from God as a sign of his love. But if that is the basis of our relationship with him and when he doesn't deliver to those expectations, there can be a disconnect in our relationship with him and hope can be snuffed out. Jeremiah remembers his afflictions, his homelessness, his bitterness, his gall and the punishments that have been inflicted on him. And he says, my soul is downcast within me. Jeremiah is going over and over in his mind all that he has lost and all that he is suffering. But verse 21 suddenly turns and he goes from thinking about himself to thinking about the Lord. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. We are not finished. It might seem bleak. It might seem as though all is lost, but we are not finished. His compassions never fail, new every morning. And then look at how he continues. A man who has lost everything says, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait on him. He may have lost everything materially, but his focus has shifted to what he has in the Lord. And the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. Jeremiah has shifted from a transactional relationship, what he had hoped to get from the Lord, to a relationship of love. My hope is in him. Shifts from wanting it now to being prepared to wait. That shift begins in the mind, from going over and over to what has gone on in the past, to focusing on the character of the Lord. This I call to mind. It's a conscious decision to shift his mind. Can you see the difference? Many years later, Jesus was suffering in the desert, 40 days fasting, and he was hungry. And he was tempted in a similar way. He had nothing, and he was tempted to turn those stones to bread. 
He was tempted to use what he had from the Lord for his own ends. Jesus refused. He may have been hungry, but he chose to respond with scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone. At the heart of Jesus' ministry was the relationship with the Father. He was the Son who sought the Father. No wonder the Father delighted in him. No wonder he said of him, in him I am well pleased. The battle for the mind, though, is so hard. We naturally go over and over what has happened. We go over our situation and our suffering and the leap to letting go and focusing on God's character and his promises, well, we may as well feel like we're jumping the canyon. It's a wrestle, but it's a wrestle we need to do when the basis of our relationship with God is based on what we hope from the Lord, we dictate the terms for the relationship. Like petulant children, we make our demands, which God may or may not grant us. But if that is the sole basis of our relationship, then when tough times come, as they surely will, and we don't get what we want, what then? The likelihood is that we just turn away saying, faith doesn't work, it's a nonsense. We want an answer in the form that we are expecting and we want it now. The last thing we want to do is to wait. And yet, if you're a parent, you'll know this. When the children are young, did you give them everything they wanted, when they wanted? If they had a tantrum and told you they hated you and stomped away and slammed the door, was it a cause for tipping them out of the house? No, as parents, we wait with compassion. We can see through their frustrations and we know what is best for them and we give them time to calm down, to shift perspective. How much more so then does God do this for us? If we read on to verse 31, he touches on more suffering, but then comes to the acknowledgement, no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. Life is a mix of grief and compassion, but Jeremiah knows where he belongs. He has a deep knowledge of the Lord's love, that it keeps him returning to him. Read on, and you will see him continue to wrestle, but overall clinging to the Lord. And yet the final verse of the whole book just cuts off in the midst. Listen to it. Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. We live in a time of uncertainty and we are weary with the situation and the ever-changing rules we are fed up with having life limited. It is easy for it to be all-consuming. We all need to have our perspective enlarged for this fosters hope. But it's not easy to learn from Jeremiah. His example raises challenging questions like, what is the basis of our relationship with the Lord? Who is at the centre? He encourages us, though, to wrestle honestly with the pain and confusion, to be honest with God. And then he demonstrates that it is possible to shift perspective, even in the midst of the most dreadful circumstances, to put our hope in who God is and his promise of compassion, mercy and love, to have our perspective enlarged. It starts by the transformation of the renewal of the mind that Paul speaks about in Romans 12. For God is a God of hope. God is always creating, recreating, renewing, restoring, right from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end. If you read again Genesis 1, embedded in that beautiful poem is hope an anticipation of the potential of creation. And God never lets that go, no matter how hopeless we may seem and feel. And Jesus invites us to help bring that hope in day by day as we pray your kingdom come and as we work for it. 
Going back to those banner panels, speaking to several people who had contributed them about their creative process, what was interesting is that for each person there was a spark. It might have been a news item or something beautiful that caught their attention. And even if they were feeling down at the time, the act of creativity lifted them, helped them to shift their perspective in some small way as they thought it through. No one had a grand plan of all the pla panels they were going to do. In fact, people who did several never anticipated doing so many. But the creativity helped them to be present to the spark and the process of creativity helped them to have a different perspective in the end and that helped them to keep hope filled. So let me ask again, what is the basis of our relationship with the Lord? Who is at the centre? Do we need to be honest about the pain and confusion we find ourselves in? And how do we have our perspective enlarged? What mind shifts do we need to make? None of us want to suffer, but it is in the places of suffering that we do our most growing, that our characters are tested and formed. Paul wrote in Romans 5, 3 to 5, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If we are in a place of feeling overwhelmed and helpless, never mind hopeless, this can feel like a step too far. But are there small steps we can admit honestly where we are that can help us to step towards changing our perspective? towards having our perspective enlarged. Lilius Trotter was a missionary in Algeria at the beginning of the 20th century, and it was a tough calling. But through her creativity of art, her meditation on God's word, she was able to draw on hope. Listen to a letter she wrote enacted by Salt Mine. Seventeenth of September, nineteen fifteen. Dear friends, thank you for your faithful and continuing support. In this season, I have been reflecting on Isaiah. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. As you know. The work here in Algeria is not without opposition. It often feels as though we live in a land of blighted promise. The hope deferred makes even the most optimistic among us almost despair of seeing lasting fruit. But we hear the sound of water, distant as it may be, and only discernible in a God-given stillness. And once we understand what it means, a new courage takes possession of us. There will be streams in the wasteland. It has been dawning on me that God is, here and now, doing a work far greater than he can let appear on the surface. We have served the people here faithfully in our weakness and seen God do things we thought were impossible. There is, however, so much he is yet to do. And I'm convinced that he will do those things in a new way. Each generation must find out its best way of doing things, unhampered by trying to keep to the conditions of the generation who went before. If it were only a matter of asking him to repeat the miracles of the past, faith would be a simpler matter. But he is not bound to reproduce. 
our God is the creator God. Look at the tiny measure of creative power given to us in music, in poetry, in art, where there is a spark of it, how it refuses to be fettered by repeating. The history of his wonders in the past is a constant succession of new things. And he is not at the end of his resources yet. He is doing a new thing. And the greatness of that work is far beyond anything we can yet see. Yours in his wonderful name, Lilius Trotter. Well, having our perspective enlarged, we turn to prayer for our world and others. And today we're going to have visual prayers in the silence, prompted by a few of the banners with some prompts for prayer in the quiet. Psalm 119, verses 49 to 50. Remember your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. My comfort is my suffering in this. Your promise preserves my life.
If you would like to know more about this hope we've spoken of today, or if you are struggling and all hope feels gone, and you would like someone to pray with you, do get in touch. Our worship continues this Sunday morning with communion. Don't forget to wrap up warm if you're joining us, and don't forget to bring your communion. Otherwise, may you be blessed as you continue on your way today. Let's return to our friends at Kinsale Court as Douglas and Father Joe bless us with words from Psalm 33. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. May God bless you and see you again soon.